Rovering to Success. A Guide for Young Manhood. Lord Baden Powell of Gilwell. 1922. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Chapter 4. Rock Number 3. Women. The danger is the risk of forgetting the chivalry due to women. The bright side is the development of the manly and protective attitude to the other sex. Sex Instincts and Risks. The Monarch of the Glen. One of the finest sights that you can see of animal life on the moor or in the forest is a full-grown stag in the pride of life. He is the king of the herd the monarch of the glen, as Landseer has pictured him. He is the embodiment of courage, strength, and virile beauty as he stands roaring out his challenge to all rivals to come on. In the rutting or mating season in autumn it is an exciting sight to watch the stags when they are calling and fighting each other for possession of the hinds. They seem to go off their heads for a time, running hither and thither, restless and excited, for weeks unable to settle down to feed or to sleep till utterly worn out. It is the strongest and finest which come out on top. In the combats that follow, with the rattle and clash of antlers and the grunting of struggling combatants, the weaker are pressed backwards by their more powerful opponents until they are driven off in flight, leaving to the victor the choice of wives as lord of the herd. And he takes his responsibilities, ready at all times and able to protect his hinds and fawns against all aggressors. The defeated weaklings can then only sneak about trying to get what joy they can among the outcasts of the herd. These poor, undersized creatures, are not thought much of by stalkers, who value rather the finer animals with their greater strength and activity. The same kind of thing goes on in a greater or lesser degree among other animals of the jungle, among the birds in spring, and even among the fishes in winter. Even plants, trees, and flowers come under the same law of nature, and in their mating season, the spring, the sap rises and spreads itself through every branch, leaf and tendril, and the flowers blossom out, so that the female pistol can receive the pollen dust from the male stamens, which is a small germ that unites with the female germ, and they jointly make the young seed for a new plant. Even the throwing out of beautiful flowers by the plants in springtime is similar to the habits of animals and birds, which put on their brightest plumage in the mating season, and this we see reproduced again among human young bloods, with their bright socks, fancy ties, and well-oiled hair. Manhood. Man, however, differs from others of nature's creatures in that, whereas in most animals there is a definite mating season, in man the instinct is always at work and there is no definite mating season. The woman's monthly periods are due to the rhythm of the organism but are not the same as the definite periods of heat that we see in other animals. When the adult sexual instinct shows itself in the growing youth, it brings about emotional changes which often feel upsetting. But remember these impulses are natural. We all have them and we must all learn how to deal with them. I get lots of letters from young fellows who have never been told what to expect when they are growing into manhood, and consequently they have felt worried by finding it an upsetting time for them. They get nervy and unsettled in their mind without knowing why. They can't settle down properly to their work, they get shy of other people and feel miserable, and occasionally think that they are going off their head. I am only too glad that in their trouble they have thought of writing to me, because in many cases I have been able to reassure them and to help them to take it calmly there is nothing in it to be upset about. It all comes from quite natural causes. When a boy grows into manhood his whole body undergoes a gradual change which anyone can see for himself. His voice becomes deeper, hair grows where it didn't grow before, his muscles become set and hardened, his organs develop, and so on. Sexual desire comes from perfectly natural causes. The change is brought about by the secretions from the organs of sex, which influence the development of the whole body and may be compared to the flow of sap in a tree. It gives the vigor of manhood to his frame, and it builds up his nerves and courage. The actual fluid secreted by the testicles and adjoining glands is called semen, which is Latin for seed. The way in which life is reproduced. This fluid contains the male organism, which is responsible for fertilizing the female organism called the ovum, which is Latin for egg. In order for life to be reproduced throughout the animal kingdom and a large part of the vegetable kingdom too, it is this union of the male organism with the female that starts the process of a new life developing. In man the male organism is called the spermatozoan and there are many thousands of these spermatozoa in a single drop of semen. Nature appears to be extravagant in malting so many of these, of which only one actually fertilizes the ovum. You can get some idea of the process by looking at these pictures of the fertilization of the hen's egg and the growth of the chick which uses up the yolk as it grows. The white contains the actual ovum which is fertilized by the spermatozoan of the cock bird when it covers the hen. By a similar process in the human being, from the joint germ there emerges a living, breathing creature of flesh, blood and bones, with eyesight, brain and mind, and even with many points of likeness in appearance and character to both of its parents. 
the germ is of vital importance for carrying on the race. And this young creature carries within it again the germs for reproducing further children in its turn, when it has grown to the riper age. The whole of this marvelous and complicated process is a work of God the Creator. The germ from which you were made was passed down by your father just as he came from the germ of his father before him, and so away back into the dark ages. And you have that germ in you to pass out, when the time comes, to join with that of your wife in making your son. So it is a sacred trust handed down to you through your father and his fathers from the Creator the Great Father of all. Sometimes, when this semen is forming over rapidly, you may find that you pass some of it out in your dreams while you are asleep. This need not alarm you, it is the natural overflow. If brought on by oneself the act is called self-abuse or masturbation. Masturbation. Young men are sensible enough, and are willing, to take advice if they can only get it, and I am certain that if only these things which I have mentioned above were better understood by them they would avoid many of the distressing and sometimes agonizing times they go through. It often used to be taught that self-abuse is a very dreadful thing leading to insanity and, at any rate, causing permanent and severe damage to the system. Now this is a grossly exaggerated picture to say the least of it. Self-abuse is obviously brought about by unnatural conditions. If we were living in a primitive state of nature, boys would behave about sex matters just as our friend the stag. There would be no moral or social check to sexual intercourse. They cannot do this for moral and social reasons, but that does not take away the primitive sexual instinct which is at the bottom of their desires. No, to have the desire is natural, so don't blame yourself for this and don't waste time in self-torture if you have abused yourself pound the tension is sometimes so great that many fellows have at times practiced masturbation. What is it really? It is the gratifying of the sexual instinct by giving oneself the feeling of satisfaction. In other words it is a form of self-love, which is obviously not a thing to cultivate. Now we are members of a community governed by certain moral laws and social conventions. Promiscuous sexual intercourse is forbidden by these moral laws, so here is the dilemma. Primitive desires versus moral and social laws. We have granted we cannot escape the desires. If our aim is to lead a healthy decent life for ourselves and others, we shall soon adjust these difficulties. Sex is not everything in life, and other energies take the place of sex and relieve the strain. The energy that the primitive male animal puts almost solely into sex, in the human, is turned into all sorts of other activities, such as art, science and a hundred and one other things. So the more interests you have and the more you follow them with keenness the less will primitive sex urges worry you and when the time comes you will have the delight of sharing them naturally with the woman who will surely be your mate. Now you can see how rovering comes in. Instead of aimless loafing and smutty talks you will find lots to do in the way of hiking and enjoyment of the out-of-door manly activities. Without knowing it you are putting something in the place of sex. Venereal disease. One almost invariable result from loose talk among lads is that they get to talk filth, and in this way lower their ideals and thoughts to a beastly standard, and one which they will be ashamed of later on when they have grown to be men. It puts them back on their road to happiness, because they will have so much leeway to make up in getting out of the mud into which they have floundered and mud always sticks to some extent. Then lads are apt to joke airily about venereal diseases which are sure, sooner or later, to overtake those who indulge their sex desires unwisely. But these diseases are no joking matter, however slight their first effects, they are desperately dangerous to a man. There are two principal venereal diseases, syphilis, pox. Poisonous infection that can be caught by connection with a person already infected. The disease shows itself in a sore at first, this develops in a few weeks into other sores, then in from 1 to 20 years it causes diseases of parts of the body or of bones, and frequently of the heart, if not properly treated. Gonorrhea, clap. Nearly always caught by connection in the same way as syphilis. Shown by discharge of matter from the organ and inflammation of the organ itself. Further inflammation is likely to follow in the bladder, etc. Syphilis is often inherited by children from diseased parents, with the result that they are blind, or deaf, or paralytic or insane. It has been estimated that 25% of people who are blind from infancy are so as the result of parents' syphilis. The sins of the fathers are indeed visited on their children. When once syphilis has got hold of you, none of the quack medicines as advertised will save you. The only way is to go at once to a good doctor and tell him straight out what has happened. If he takes you in time he will be able to cure you. But the danger is not one which anyone will joke about once he knows the depth of it, is it? A visit to any lock hospital will give you such examples of venereal disease as will persuade you, better than any words of mine, to avoid having anything to do with women of the street if you would save yourself in body as well as soul. The folly of taking such a risk is largely the result of being carried away by the weaknesses of the herd. 
It is like drinking or gambling, a disease which you pick up from letting yourself drift too far without thinking, in the company of a lot of other unthinking young fellows. Many men come to grief from supposing that if they go with a girl who is not a regular prostitute of the streets, there will be no danger of being infected with the disease. But the reports show that the danger is actually greater. The girl who has once been deceived by some blackguard of a man loses her sense of shame and is willing occasionally to go with other men. But in her ignorance she is more liable than the professional to harbor disease, from not knowing what precautions to take. Therefore, she is all the more dangerous to herself, poor creature, and to others with whom she comes in contact. A man may be continent and resolve to remain so. He may then by chance, or by boon companions, be led to take that fatal sixth glass, and, with brain and senses clouded, do the very things he meant not to do. That is where so many a good fellow has come to grief and ruined himself not only morally, in his character, but physically, in his body, as well. There is a play called Damaged Goods which deals with the venereal question in an open, common-sense way, and is a good education for a young man. It tells of a young man's infecting his wife and child, and the child's nurse, through ignorance. The pathetic cry which there comes in, if I had only known in time, is one which is echoed in hundreds of cases every day. Sins of the fathers visited upon the children. When I was writing this chapter a friend asked me whether it was really true that syphilis was passed on by a father to his children to the extent suggested. I only had to show him a letter that had appeared in the Times that morning from a coroner, in which he said that the loss of life or of reason and the infection of innocent children from this awful disease is terrible in the extreme. Manliness. Chivalry. You will, I hope, have gathered from what I have said about this rock woman, that it has its dangers for the woman as well as for the man. But it has also its very bright side if you only maneuver your canoe aright. The paddle to use for this job is chivalry. Most of the points which I have suggested as being part of the right path are comprised under chivalry. The knights of old were bound by their oath to be chivalrous, that is to be protective and helpful to women and children. This means on the part of the man a deep respect and tender sympathy for them, coupled with a manly strength of mind and strength of body with which to stand up for them against scandal, cruelty or ridicule, and even, on occasion, to help them against their own failings. A man without chivalry is no man. A man who has this chivalry and respect for women could never lower himself to behave like a beast, nor would he allow a woman to ruin herself with him by losing her own self-respect and the respect of others. It is up to him to give the lead and that a right one, and not to be led astray. I have known such chivalry on the part of a man to give further than this, even to the point of raising a woman who had fallen, where she had expected him to join her in debauchery his courteous respect for her, which overlooked her faults and was given because she was a woman, caused her once more to think of her own self-respect and so restored her to her place. Chivalry, like other points of character, must be developed by thought and practice, but when gained it puts a man on a new footing and a higher one with himself and with the world. To be chivalrous he must put woman on a pedestal, and see all that is best in her, he must also have sympathy for the weaker folk, the aged and the crippled, and he must give protection to the little ones. For this he must use his self-control to switch off all that is impure from his mind and ensure that his own ideas are clean and honorable, that his sense of duty is so high that ridicule and chaff will mean nothing to him. Not my job. Not my job is usually the camouflage under which a coward endeavors to conceal his one of chivalry. But for a man anything that can be helpful to anyone is his job. I don't mean by that that he should therefore poke his nose into other people's business, or ask them, are you saved? And so on. But if he can lend a hand to a woman who is down, or help a young fellow who is trying to keep up and clean, then he can do a great good through his chivalry. And, moreover, he can be of service to others by the very example he sets of leading a clean, upright life, and by showing that he is not ashamed of so doing. It is up to you to be master of yourself. The thing is to remember, as I have said before, that you are you, and you have got to make your own road for yourself if you mean to gain happiness. Come out of the herd and take your own practical steps towards dealing with the desires that come upon you in the course of nature. Keep away from loose companions, whether men or girls, take on lots of other occupation and healthy exercise, such as boxing, walking, hikes, football, rowing, etc. Keep your thoughts off lewdness by taking up hobbies and good reading in your spare time. Keep off drink and over smoking, overeating, sleeping in too warm or soft a bed, since all these help to make the temptation worse. Athletics are also a great outlet to one's natural forces. They have the elements of struggle and victory by physical force, which accompany war, but they should take its place and not be used as training for turning boys into cannon fodder. You all know about scouting and the immense value that it has, so we need not go into that anymore. 
Now one word about tolerance, we are all different and we must not think that because other fellows seem inferior to us, they are to be despised. For example, you may be a good athlete and Smith may be a poor one, but very good at books. Don't despise him, but live and let live. Now we have taken a pretty good look at the problems of sex as they arise in boyhood. I hope you feel happier about them. Life should be natural and easy, and the healthier a life you lead, the less these problems will arise and bother you. Remember that if you do get troubles that worry you, the best way is to take them to an older man your father, if you can talk to him, or an understanding doctor or master. Brooding over troubles never does any good. If one really lives up to the scout's code, one can't go far wrong. There is an old tag in Latin, which we might do well to close with, mens sana in corpore sano. A healthy mind in a healthy body. A good thing to aim at. Keep yourself clean inside and out by daily washing, and swimming if you can. Constipation and neglect to keep the racial organ clean daily are apt to cause slight irritation which leads to trouble. It will be a struggle for you, but if you are determined to win you will come out of it all the better for the experience. You will have strengthened your character and your self-control. You will have come through clean-minded and wholesome, and you will have fortified your body with the full power of manhood. Remember also that you have done this, not only for your own sake, but because you have a duty to the nation, to the race, that is, to beget strong, healthy children in your turn, and to do this you have to keep yourself pure. Some fellows seem to think that if they don't let themselves go now and then, they will not be able to perform when they get married later on. This is absolute nonsense. Continence does not weaken your powers. I have had so many letters from young men on the subject that I quote a reply that I have sent them, as it may meet the anxiety of others. I am very glad indeed to hear that you have managed to keep yourself straight in spite of the continued temptation. In reply to your question, I don't think you need have any fear about being able to marry, provided that you go on as you are now doing. Lots of fellows have, to my knowledge, been afraid to marry thinking that they might be impotent, because of their having indulged in self-abuse when young. But they found that they were all right after all, and so I hope and expect it will be in your case. Auto Suggestion Imagination runs off into daydreams, and these may be suggestive ones which bring on temptation. Yet imagination is the important part of autosuggestion or self-cure, and therefore the lad who is given to daydreams is really the one who has the best power for curing himself if he only sets about it on the lines that I have suggested. The parents' influence. A large proportion of the men who have risen to eminence in the world admit that they have owed very much of their character and success to the influence of their mother. And this is natural, since in any case she has been the one who cared for him and watched over his upbringing from his earliest childhood. She has given of her best for him. The man owes a debt to his mother such as he can never fully repay. But the best that he can do in this direction is to show that he is grateful and prove himself worthy of and bring success to her efforts. She has probably dreamed ambitious dreams to herself of what her boy would do in the world, and disappointment, as bitter as it is secret, will overshadow her where he turns out a waster or a failure. Boys don't think of this enough. They are cruel without intending it, they are apt to forget how much she has done for them and how grateful she would be for the smallest return. I remember Sir Thomas Lipton telling me the story of his life, and I realized how he made his mother a happy woman when, as a shop boy, he brought her the first week's wages he had earned. Why, Thomas, she said, you will be getting me a carriage and pair next eye. That little remark caught his imagination, and on it he built up his ambition. His whole effort was then devoted to the one aim of making enough money to buy a carriage and pair as a surprise offering to his mother. He told me that, among the many exciting incidents of his life, the proudest and happiest moment was that when he was able to actually hand over to her the prize that he had gained for her. So in making your own way to success remember that as you progress it will not be merely a satisfaction to yourself but it will bring a real happiness in a quarter where it is most deserved in your mother's heart. And when some of these difficulties or temptations of which I have spoken are troubling you, turn your thoughts to your mother. Think what her wish would be. Act upon it, and it will pull you through. If problems arise which you feel you cannot cope with by yourself, talk them over with your father. Remember he has been through the same difficulties as you and will be able to help. If for any reason your father is not available there will be some older man you can trust to whom you can go. Save yourself and help to preserve the race. Now, as I have said before, in giving you these ideas I am only trying to help you to get happiness. Happiness depends to a large extent on health, though it also depends on knowing that you are aiming to help the general well-being of the country as well as of yourself. It is no use you're getting married, indeed in some cases it is a crime to do so, unless you are fit and healthy and able to beget healthy children. And part of your responsibility as a parent will be to teach your children how to grow up healthy. 
Well, there is an awful lot of happiness missed in our country through ill health, and most of that ill health could be prevented if fellows only took reasonable care of themselves. Do you know that only one man in three is really healthy, and that one in every ten is an invalid? Out of eight million young men young men, mind you, not the old worn outs called up for army service in the Great War, over one million were found to be medically unfit for service. A large proportion of these were born healthy, but were allowed by their parents or they allowed themselves to become weak and feeble. A further proportion were born defective because of the defects in their fathers or mothers very largely from venereal disease. If you added up all the working hours that men lose through sickness in Great Britain every year, it would amount to 14 million weeks. Just think what this means in trade and wages, and yet that loss is largely preventable if fellows only knew how to take care of themselves and had the sense to do it. If you are an engineer you know what tremendous care is necessary in keeping the machinery properly lubricated, fed with fuel, gentle use of levers, thorough cleaning of all its parts, constant care and attention are necessary, together with a close knowledge of each particular bit of the machinery, if you are to have it in good working order, running smoothly and efficiently. But in your own body you have a machine more wonderful than any man-made engine and one that needs still closer attention and better understanding if you are to keep it well. And what is more, you can, by taking care of it, improve it and make it bigger and stronger, which is more than the engineer can do with his engine. Yet how few fellows understand anything about their inside and its wonderful mechanism, they try to drive an engine that they know nothing about, they give it all sorts of wrong treatment and then expect it to keep sound and to work well. How to keep healthy and strong. When I was serving in the fever jungles, both on the east and the west coasts of Africa, I noticed that many of us were healthy enough so long as we were on the march every day, but that whenever we had a day's halt and rested some of us were sure to get fever. I argued it out in my own mind that our blood got cleaned and freshened every day through the daily rear and sweating out of waste stuff in one system. A day of rest meant less perspiring and more feeding than usual and therefore less drainage of one's inside. So I always made a point of going in for a good bit of exercise on a rest day, and sticking to my usual small amount of food and drink. I never had a day sickness, and at one time averaged 20 miles a day marching for over a week in a pretty soggy atmosphere. Never felt fitter. I had one white officer with me, but he had to be replaced five times by fresh men owing to sickness. Well, I put it down to keeping my blood clean and pure. It is pure blood that makes your body, muscle and fiber grow and keep strong. And the heart that pumps it through the body is the most important organ that you have. The scout's pace, i.e., alternate running and walking for short spells of 20 or 30 paces, saves men from the heart strain of long-distance running, which is not a sport that everyone is physically fitted for. Fresh air. The blood needs loads of oxygen as fresh air to keep it fresh. Living indoors without fresh air quickly poisons the blood and makes people feel tired and seedy when they don't know why. For myself I sleep out of doors in winter as well as summer. I only feel tired or seedy when I have been indoors a lot. I only catch cold when I sleep in a room. The British Medical Journal has reported that living in the open air improved the metabolism, there's a word. It means getting the best chemical value from the food we eat, of patients in one hospital to the extent of 40% above the average. Cleanliness. I have said clean yourself from inside, but also it is important to clean yourself outside if you want to be healthy. Cavalry soldiers used to be noted for their cleanliness, the truth is they learnt from grooming their horses and cleaning them up at least twice a day how very important it is to health and freshness, to have the skin and parts properly cleaned. A bath cannot always be got every day, but a wet and scrubby towel can always be made available and should be used without fail. Breathing. The Red Indians used to train their children while they were yet babies to breathe through the nose and not through the mouth. This was partly with the idea of teaching them not to snore and so give themselves away to the enemy in the night, but also because they believed that an open mouth reflected on the character of the man. My Red Indian friends once told me of an Englishman who wanted to fight a duel with a Red Indian, but with true idea of fair play he declined to use pistols or other weapons that the Red Indian was unaccustomed to. So he suggested that they should strip and be armed with a knife apiece and fight it out in that way. The Indian smiled and said he would fight if the Englishman still wished it, but that it would go badly with the Englishman. When asked his reasons for this he said that he had noticed the Englishman habitually kept his mouth half open and he had no fear whatever of a man who did that. It was the sign of a weak character. Whether or not an open mouth is an indication of weak character I would not know but it is certain that the man who breathes through his mouth sucks in poisonous germs from the air, instead of getting them caught up in the moisture inside his nostrils. The way to catch flu or any other disease that is flying about is to breathe with your mouth open. Teeth. 
It is said that nearly half the ill health of the nation may be traced to bad teeth. Although people start with good teeth as children, there are very few that have a sound set after 25, and this is mainly because of their own want of care of their teeth. Children are not taught the importance of cleaning their teeth thoroughly alter meals, and grown-ups don't bother about it. Diseased teeth and gums not only prevent you from properly chewing your food, but breed germs and microbes in your mouth which go down with your food and give you continual small doses of poison which gradually make you seedy and depressed without your knowing the reason. If you want to see what you have in the way of germs in your mouth it is an interesting experiment to put some hydrogen peroxide with water in a glass and dip a clean toothbrush into it. Nothing happens. Brush your teeth over with the toothbrush and dip it again into the glass and you will see myriads of bubbles rising in the water, which means so many germs being knocked out. Exercise. I was asked once by a high authority in education whether I did not think that the cost of erecting gymnasia in every town though it might amount to millions would be money well spent because it would develop the health and strength of manhood. I replied that the two strongest, healthiest races I happened to know were the Zulus and the Bhutani peasants of the Himalayas, but in neither country had I ever noticed a gymnasium. There was plenty of God's fresh air, and lots of walking and running and climbing to be done in the daily work of these people, and I believed that these were good enough tonics for any man but both fresh air and exercise are absolutely essential to health, both when you are growing and when you have grown up. I always begin the day with a little bit of body twisting, in the open, when I tumble out of bed but that is only a start. Some men go in for physical drill, and some for dumbbell and other muscle developing exercises till they come out all over lumps that look fine in a photo when you brace them up, but are not of the slightest practical use to you. And this work is generally done indoors. Your exercise must be out of doors in the fresh air, and the very best you can get is at the same time the easiest and cheapest, namely, walking. Weekend walking tours are the very best thing for health of mind as well as of body. The Rucksack I know nothing more enjoyable or more cheering and health-giving than a good old tramp every weekend. A knapsack on your back makes you absolutely free and independent. You load it with only the essential things and no luxuries. It is not merely every pound but every ounce of weight that tells on a long march. Nothing can beat the Norwegian type of rucksack with its light wooden or metal frame which holds it securely in position without galling or overheating your back. It will take in addition to your clothing a light little tent that can be set up on your staff or on a tree stem, and your sleeping quilt and waterproof sheet. Thus equipped weekend hikes are possible, and what is more enjoyable all the year round. Weather? Can anything be better than a good long tramp on a cold blowy day? If it is wet, all the better. You get a very real enjoyment out of a good fire and shelter in a snug farmhouse or in at the end of the day. I tell you, you get so hardened by practice of the out of doors that you really don't notice the weather very much and you mind it less. Whatever it is, hot or cold, rain or shine, you gain strength, vitality and cheeriness by it. Be a man. A clean young man in his prime of health and strength is the finest creature God has made in this world. I once had charge of a party of Swazi chiefs on their visit to England. At the end of their stay, when they had seen most of the interesting sights of the country, I asked them what had struck them as the most wonderful of all that they had seen. They were, incidentally, wonderful sights themselves, having discarded their fine native dress for top hats and frock coats. They unanimously agreed that the finest thing in England was the London omnibus. They were so taken with its brilliant colours and the idea of its being entirely for joyriding. The next best thing in their judgment was the troop of gymnastic instructors at the gymnasium at Aldershot. When they saw these men performing their various exercises they were tremendously taken with them, but they were not fully satisfied until they had had the men stripped and had examined for themselves their muscular development. And I must say these gymnasts were magnificent specimens of what a man should be, and active and alert in mind as well as in body. God has given you a body, no, He has lent it to you, to make the best use of, to take care of, to strengthen and build up into a really fine figure of a man and a father of children. You can do this if you like it is up to you. And what a splendid adventure it can be. St. George fighting the dragon won't be in it with you, who fight the dragon of temptation and down him so that you may in the end present yourself a man, clean and strong and chivalrous to the girl whom you love. You will also have taken a further step towards happiness, and will have fitted yourself bodily for the service of God in carrying on the race on the best lines. Marriage. You are bound to have your love adventures. I know the difficulty that you are faced with. There is little enough of romance and excitement in the ordinary life of a town or village, and at your particular age, woman comes into your thoughts in a new and alluring way. It is a great adventure, therefore, to a young lad to seek out a girl for himself. 
sometimes he likes to show her off before the others as a sign of his manliness, in other cases he prefers to get her all to himself. Don't think this unnatural. It is all in the course of nature. As I have said above, it is in accordance with the law that governs animals as well as man. But in the case of man there is this difference. He has a mind and intelligence which the animal does not possess, he sees romance in selecting a mate to whom he can give his admiration, love and devotion. These are far above the mere animal instinct. They form human love instead of animal lust, and the higher he raises himself above the animal instinct the less he is of the beast and the more he is of the man. A main step to happiness in this direction is to select the right kind of girl. There are women and, and there are dolls. Calf love. As a very young man you will of course go entirely by her face and figure and you may fall in love with one girl after another desperately in love, and sometimes will have perhaps two or three on your string at a time. Probably you may think it the most glorious adventure and most probably a few days later the most disastrous tragedy that ever happened to anyone. It comes to most young fellows about this period to feel like committing suicide over a love quarrel but they don't do it. You may comfort yourself by knowing that all this is what comes to every lad, and is known as calf love. There is no harm in it, and nothing to be ashamed of nor to be depressed about. Indeed in a short time, when the really right girl has come along, you will laugh at your first ideas of love making. But in that calf love period don't forget you are a man. Behave like a man. Play fair and square with the girl and remember your future son for whom some day you will be responsible. And you will be on the right side if you only take on with a girl whom you can bring to your own home without shame, among your mother and sisters. Remember that whoever she is, she may be someone else's sister. Think of him and behave to her as you would wish him to behave to your sister. How to get the right girl? The right girl will come along sooner or later if you have kept your head your calf love will have disappeared. You will find a girl whose character you admire and respect, whose tastes are like your own and whose comradeship you long for. It will not be merely her person that attracts you but her personality. You will find a new, calmer and deeper form of love that links and binds you to her, one which, if you are wise, will never grow less. And you will expect her to come to you pure and clean, won't you? But what about yourself? Are you going to expect of her what you cannot offer in return yourself? that would neither be manly nor fair. No, if you are going to enjoy real happiness in life that is the supreme joy of being married to a really good woman from whom you hope for love and respect. Don't begin your married life with a lie, else you will be lying all through it, and there will be an end to trusting each other. Warning from a pork butcher on getting engaged. If you have never read a book called A Self-Made Merchant's Letters to His Son You've Got a Treat in Store for You. It is a most amusing bit of reading, but at the same time full of jolly sound advice. The merchant is an American pork packer, writing to his son who holds a junior post in the business. He hears that his son is hanging about after a certain young lady. So he says, I suppose I am fanning the air when I ask you to be guided by my judgment in this matter because while a young fellow will consult his father about buying a horse, he is cocksure of himself when it comes to picking a wife. Marriages may be made in heaven, but most engagements are made in the back parlor with the gas so low that a fellow really doesn't get a square look at what he's taking. While a man doesn't see much of a girl's family when he is courting, he is apt to see a good deal of it when he is housekeeping. Your ma and I set up housekeeping in one of those cottages you read about in storybooks, but that you want to shy away from when it is put up to you to live in one of them. There were nice climbing roses on the front porch, but no running water in the kitchen, there were plenty of old-fashioned posies in the front yard and plenty of rats in the cellar, there was half an acre of ground at the back, but so little room inside that I had to sit with my feet out of window. It was just the place to go for a picnic, but it's been my experience that a fellow does most of his picnicking before he is married. But one way and another we managed to get a good deal of satisfaction out of it, because we had made up our minds to get our fun out of everything as we went along. With most people happiness is something that is always just a day off, but I have made it a rule never to put off being happy till tomorrow. I have italicized that. Of course when you are married you've got to make an income, and this is going to take so much time and thought that you won't have a very wide margin left for golf. I simply mention this in passing, because I see in the Chicago papers that you were among the players on the links one afternoon a fortnight ago. Golf's a nice foolish game and there ain't any harm in it so far as I know, but a young fellow who wants to be a boss butcher hasn't much daylight to waste on any kinds of links except sausage links. Of course a man should have a certain amount of play, just as a boy is entitled to a piece of pie at the end of his dinner, but he don't want to make a meal of it. Of course your salary isn't a large one yet, but you can buy a whole lot of happiness with $50 a week when you have a right sort of woman for your purchasing agent, and, while I don't go much on love in a cottage, 
Love in a flat with 50 a week as a starter is just about right if the girl is just about right. If she isn't, it doesn't make any special difference how you start out, you're going to end up all wrong. Money ought never to be the consideration about marriage, but it always ought to be a consideration. When a boy and girl don't think about it enough before the ceremony they're going to have to think altogether too much about it after, and when a man is doing sums at home, evenings, it comes kind of awkward for him to try to hold his wife on his lap. There is nothing in this talk that two can live cheaper than one. A good wife doubles a man's happiness and doubles his expenses, but it is a pretty good investment if a fellow has got the money to invest. A married man is worth more salary than a single one, because his wife makes him work more. He is apt to go to bed a little sooner and to get up a little earlier, to go a little steadier and to work a little harder than the fellow who has got to amuse a different girl every night and can't stay at home to do it. That's why I am going to raise your salary to $75 a week the day you marry. On the other hand, in Enchanter's Nightshade you find. Men all seem to want to make money directly they get to a city. Well, they must marry. You don't need a deal of money unless the girl is all wrong. There is truth is both ideas, but the advice from the old pork packer is sound, if less romantic, and it is your business before marrying to see that you are in a position to keep a wife and family, otherwise you will be condemning these as well as yourself to a struggle for existence. Success in business is not a matter of luck or favor or interest, nor even of learning, so much as of ability and character. Expert skill in your work is bound to tell, but for promotion to higher grades, character that is absolute trustworthiness, tact, and energy is essential. This applies practically to every trade or profession. I was asked the other day what I meant by tact, and I could only reply by quoting the old example of the tactful plumber who, on entering a bathroom which had carelessly been left unlocked by the lady using the bath, promptly said, I beg pardon, sir. I didn't know you were here, and strolled out again. A man's duties on getting married. Someone once told me my fortune by looking at the lines on the palm of my hand, and he said, your line of head is stronger than your line of heart, meaning that I should not be carried off my legs by the first beautiful girl I saw but that I should think as much about the character of the girl I admired as about her appearance, and that is, I am certain, the way to make your choice. Take care lest, in making your choice, you think too much of what you would require in your future wife and forget her point of view and what she would like of you as a husband. Think of that. When I got married, an old friend, on giving me his congratulations, also gave me a new vision of my future state when he said, my dear fellow, I have been married over 12 years and it is still a honeymoon with us. Life has gone on getting happier and happier for us. And in my turn I too have since found the truth of this. I should hope that it will be the case with you who read this, but it means using your line of head as well as heart, it means getting the right girl to start with. Mind you, it is only a little step to ask a girl to say yes, but on that word depends a layaway sentence to both of you, consigning you both to happiness or hell. Then, as I said above, be wise, that is, in taking the girl to be your wife for better or worse you are rather apt in the rosy sunshine of it all to forget that worse. Clouds may come and you've got to be prepared for them that's what I mean by being wise. Have no secrets from your wife and she will have none from you and all will be plain sailing. There may be times of trouble, little difficulties in the home which you don't foresee at first. Before you married you only did things for yourself, now that you are married you've got to chuck yourself and do things for your wife and later on for your children. You have got to catch yourself up in little bits of selfishness on your part, such, for instance, as grousing at the food because it isn't exactly to your liking, and that sort of thing. Look at things from her point of view. Grousing won't mend matters. Give instead some of the little love gifts of your courting days, of admiration and praise, give and take and smile all the time but most especially at that time when most women get a little off their usual line, just before the first baby arrives. You've got to show your manliness and chivalry as her comforter and protector then. If she is a little fractious it is through her love for you that she is so. To such attention she will respond. Women are not only more grateful than men, but their character shapes itself according as it is led by their man. If he be nasty she will nag, if he be nice then she will be nicer, and then there's love and laughter in the home. Children have you ever read Rudyard Kipling's story they? I read it long before I was married, away out in the bush in Africa. The point in that story that went home to me was not the delightful description of English scenery, of the old world home and garden, etc., it was where the man imagined that he felt the clinging of little children's fingers in his hand, he only imagined it, but it thrilled him to the core. And I had that imagination in my mind for years as vividly as in the story. But when it came to pass that I actually felt a tiny hand in mine, the hand of my own little child, it gave me something more than a thrill a feeling that has never worn off with custom, 
for it still does so the heart-filling joy of it never grows less. But, there. Try it for yourself, in your own home, of your own making and you will know what happiness is. There is nothing like it and it cannot be described, at least not by me. So, as I have already said before, heaven is not just a vague something somewhere up in the skies. It is right here on earth, in your own home. It does not depend on riches or position, but rests with you to make it, in your own way, with your own brain, and heart, and hands. And you can do it if only you like to use these aright. Responsibilities of Parenthood But the joy of being a father brings with it a big responsibility. Children learn mainly by the example of their elders. A grousing, selfish father must not be surprised if one day his son swears at him and goes his own way, the father will get later on what he gives out today. Train your children through love rather than fear. A kindly parent gains a loving daughter and devoted sons. As I have suggested before, you will be happier if you aim to leave this world a little better for your being in it. One step in this direction, and one which is within your reach as a father, is to make your boy a better man than yourself, by teaching him all that you know, what to aim for and what to avoid. Especially he will want your helpful advice when he, in his turn approaches manhood. Think how much or how little your father did for you and go one better with your son. You will be the happier for it. But are you prepared for this? You may have been educated, or you may have educated yourself for your profession in life, which after all can only last a certain number of years, but have you gone through any training for this much more important point, on which depends so much the future lives of your children? Have you had any practice yourself in the training and upbringing of boys? Of knowing their ways, of judging their temperaments, of developing their character? This is all of grave importance to you in your responsible position as a parent. I hope in the concluding chapters to give you a few practical suggestions about it. Many parents object to their sons being told about sex matters and venereal disease. I have heard men curse their parents for not having told them. Personally I don't think that any parent who has seen something of the effects of ignorance, or of what is worse, the wrong notions which boys pick up all too soon from their fellows, would hesitate about warning his sons. A final tip for happiness. But I warn you that there is still another item needed to make your heaven complete. A man came to me who had been a big game hunter and naturalist in Central Africa, he had been a farmer in British Columbia, he had started a tobacco plantation in East Africa, and he had seen the world in a life of adventure and romance. He had now settled down in an island of his own in the Indian Ocean in a glorious climate of sunshine amongst beautiful and healthy surroundings. One might well have thought, as he did at first, that this was going to be a heavenly haven after all his strenuous wanderings, but he had now come to discover a fly in the ointment. He realized that he was living comfortably merely for himself. This conviction had now brought him to give up that existence and exchange it for life, that is, for activity and doing something for others. I had myself gone through much the same experience when I finished my career as a soldier. It had been a pretty varied and strenuous one, bringing a good deal of the rough along with the smooth, and I had loved every minute of it. At the end my ambition was to settle down in a little farm in some out-of-the-way corner of the world. I planned it out, but then the second thought arose which made me realize that idleness and indulgence of self did not mean happiness that true happiness could only be got through service. So there is another chapter to this book. To sum up, sex is universal in all forms of life, man, the lower animals, birds, fishes and reptiles. It is also found in the vegetable kingdom and in the most primitive forms of living matter. There is no sin in sex. The sin arises when sex is abused. In primitive, unspoiled man, where sex is simply taken as a matter of course, the same problems do not arise, as in civilized men. Here there has always been a certain shame and mystery about this matter. This must lead to much guilt and abuse. The problem of prostitution comes in and venereal disease appears. This form of disease is unknown among really primitive, unspoiled races. It is only when these races get contaminated by civilization that such diseases appear. They are indeed dreadful afflictions. Syphilis if not promptly and properly treated may not only affect the person who contracts it, but he may pass it on to his offspring. Blindness, paralysis and insanity are all possible after effects. Gonorrhea, in the same way, may have lasting effects, and babies who are infected from the mother are often hopelessly blind. It is right that you should know about these diseases and what may be the consequences of promiscuous sex. It happens fairly often that a girl who has been with men and who is not a real prostitute, may have a slight form of venereal disease, which shows so little that she may not even realize she has it. You see how dangerous this sort of thing can be. If by unfortunate folly you or your friends ever acquired any form of venereal disease, the only thing to remember is to go at once to your doctor. 
With modern methods of treatment these diseases can be cured when taken in time. Remember that the ideal to aim at is for a man to be clean as the girl he is going to marry. If there were sex equality in this matter it would be a great step towards a healthier attitude. However, you cannot expect to solve all these difficult problems which social reformers and others have studied for many years with little result up to the present. You can each one of you, however, do your bit in bringing about a better state of affairs. Sex is often the matter for sly, obscene jokes when there is really nothing funny about it. As we have seen it is part of all living things and only requires proper management. What others have said on the subject. Men ought to be mighty good to women, for nature gave them the big end of the log to lift and mighty little strength to do it with, Abraham Lincoln. Have a heart that never hardened, and a temper that never tries, and a touch that never hurts, Charles Dickens. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and the favor of the Lord, Proverbs 18. 22. Health is worth more than wealth. Cleanliness is next to godliness. A gentleman is a bloke what keeps even his toenails clean. Fear of a father does not necessarily mean respect for him. The cane often makes the coward and the liar. Men. With the help of God, be men, heard at St. Gervais Church, Paris. As man was created for health, so was man created for happiness, Maeterlinck. Let not thy fancy be guided by thine eye, nor let thy will be formed by thy fancy, let thy understanding moderate between thine eye and thy fancy, if quarrels.